or something that only lasted for, you know, eight seconds. You don't have enough information to judge it. Don't judge it. Just go with it. Have the conversation. It doesn't matter whether it's you or something else. What matters is, is it useful? Is it, you know, is it useful? And if you don't know it's useful yet, then just keep at it. Do it for six months, and you've been talking with this entity for six months, then judge. Then say, is this useful? Am I really getting something here, or am I just, you know, is it all just intellectual blather? Is this really valuable or not? If it is valuable, go on with it. Does it matter who you're talking to, or what? If it's your higher self, or somebody else, or who knows what, it's not important. Just do it. But you'll find out whether it's inside you or outside of you. You will get concepts and ideas that just aren't in you, just aren't part of your makeup, aren't part of your experience, and you'll recognize it right away. So you'll know that the, the biggest mistake is to try to know immediately before you have enough data to know. And if you've done this for, for six months and it's not going anywhere and you're not getting anything in it, well then let it go. Try somebody else. Say, I'd like to speak to somebody else. Not you. you know? I want the supervisor. Yeah, I want the supervisor. <laughs> the supervisor right, exactly. Good point. Yes. How, how do you see our creation of virtual reality in the digital world as in, in the role of either increasing or decreasing entropy? Okay, the, the fact that we make virtual reality is like World of Warcraft and, and The Sims, that sort of thing, our creation. Is that what you meant? Virtual yes. reality? Yes. Well, it's part. The whole thing is a fractal process. Okay, reality is a fractal process. It's not a geometric fractal. We, you know, we only think of fractals in terms of little geometric shapes, and they repeat and build on each other, and that's a geometric fractal. It's a process fractal. So you have a process, and this little process has an input and an output, and then you take the output and make it the input to the next to the same kind of process, and the output of that becomes the input to the next same process. That's how the process builds on itself, just like a geometric fractal may have a triangle, and then you put another triangle in the face of that triangle on this side, another triangle here, and you put triangles of different sizes, that's how you make a, ge a geometric fractal. Well, a process fractal is what this reality is. So what happens is that here you have a, a digital information system who makes a virtual reality that then makes a another virtual reality within that virtual reality, which then makes another virtual reality within that virtual reality. It sounds like a movie called The Thirteenth Floor, doesn't it? Where you have virtual realities inside virtual realities. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a fractal process. You're just seeing the fractal work its thing out. So, so one so day, our virtual realities may have conscious characters in them. So that as above, so below, we get to learn from yes. looking at those other virtual realities. Right, and then our, our Hewlett Packard mainframe may be that server that is the larger consciousness system to those people, you see? And our larger conscious system may be somebody else's Hewlett Packard mainframe in which we're interacting. So does this turn on itself like the Ouroboros? Well, not necessarily that it turns on itself. It's just, you know, fractals don't have to go on forever, but they can. Depends on how much computer time you want to, you know, you want to give to them. They just get more and more complex and bigger and bigger as they spread out. But they can stop. You know, anytime you can say, well, that's enough. Anything more is not helping the evolution process. Well, they can also be degenerative. It can also be degenerative. Right. So what you, what you need is a system that is stable, or at least stable enough to create a good schoolhouse. Okay, now this schoolhouse that we have, this universe, is not perfectly stable. It's, it's, you know, the second law of thermodynamics says that if we wait long enough, there'll be nothing in our universe but, you know, hydrogen gas, right? Elementary particles, you know, photons and hydrogen gas, everything will disintegrate because the entropy of this virtual reality, our physical universe, always is increasing. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So eventually, the sun expands, it explodes, we're cinders, we turn to dust, you know, eventually all the complex things break down into simple things. It's just like, you know, friction. You know, so you always wear it out eventually. So it's not stable in that sense, but it's stable long enough to serve the purpose. And it's just a virtual reality. If you want to rerun it, hey, you know, go back to wherever you want to start from, hit the button, and take off. Reboot. Reboot. Reboot and go again. You had a question. Yeah. I, um, well, when I do the paintings, 
the, these paintings here, mm -hmm. um, I'll have a thought in my mind and I'll go ahead and start painting. But then when the painting is finished, it has another reality to it mm -hmm. altogether. And things appear in it that I didn't even know I was trying to paint. Mm -hmm. It's kind of basically describing what you're talking about. Yes. Um, as long as I stay out of my mind. Stay out of your intellect. <laughs> yeah. What you do is stay out of your intellect. Yeah. That's the problem most of us have with life, is that uh -huh. we can't make that intellect sit down and shut up. It's just uh -huh. always there judging, assessing, evaluating, and analyzing. And if we could just get it to sit down and be quiet, we could get all kinds of information. We could query all sorts of things. We could be lots of creative stuff. Lots of paintings come from that larger system if you're just intuitive and let them flow. That's the trick. The good artist isn't necessarily the one with the precise technique. It's the one that can connect to something bigger than just themselves. Because if they're just painting out of their intellect, it's just technique. It's not, you know, it's not something that just grabs people. Well, it's the same with music. It's the same with literature. It's the same with everything. You know, it's the same with science. You know, if you look at the big scientists who made big breakthroughs, most of them didn't say, well, I just worked on this and, you know, calculated on it all night and finally I figured it out. Most of them will say, well, gee, you know, I woke up and the idea was there. Or I was in this relaxed state and, you know, meditating and listening to the, you know, to Mozart or something and, oh, the idea just popped into my mind. Well, that's when they, they open up and let go and can receive what they need. But yeah, that's that's the creative process, is mm -hmm. getting that intellect to sit down and be quiet. The intellect isn't really very creative. The intellect's main job is to justify what the ego wants. <laughs> that's its main job. So the ego says, no, this is right, and this is what I want, and this is wonderful and true and compassionate and, and so on. And the, the, the intellect says, yes, it is. You're a fine person. You've done everything you could, and this is the best decision. That's what your intellect is really good at. It's justifying the, the needs and wants of the ego. I mean, it's good for other things to help you find your lost car keys too. But it's 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 mostly that's what we use that's what we use our intellect for. Do you do you see the intellect as being um, like tools? It's a tool. Yeah, just just tools to, to yeah. use for that. It's a tool, and it can be a good tool. Mm -hmm. It can give us direction. It can say, wow, this is interesting. I want to find out more about this. So it, it can lead and give direction and so on. It's not that the intellect is a, you know, is entirely you know, a, a waste or negative. The intellect is a very good tool, but it's just a tool. If we make it God, if we make it the leader, if we make it the only thing that's important, that's where we get into trouble. And if we can't let it go and tell it to be quiet a while, you know, we, we'd like to just be for a while. You know, we don't need all this incessant stuff then we have problems. Then we become left brain dominant and our whole world becomes logical process and you know we become science majors in, in, in school and get degrees and things and then become engineers and so on and our whole world is like this. You know, this, then this, then this, then this and that's how we think, that's how we function and we get so tied up in logical process we're not even aware that we have feelings. Oh, we have them all right. We're not even aware of them. I know you ladies are saying that's impossible. You know, but nobody could ever get up that that far off the base. But that's true. A lot of people who are very dominant left brain aren't even aware of the feelings that they have because the feelings aren't logical. Therefore, they reject them. They don't deal with them. Yes. Do you have thoughts about the things that are happening in our solar system? Uh, changes with the sun and uh, things coming in here, or other planets or not, how that reflects the consciousness and what's, what's going on in the evolution of consciousness? Well, you know, it's all, the whole universe is one virtual reality in a larger consciousness system. Many virtual realities in a larger consciousness system. This physical, what we call the physical universe, is just one virtual reality. Now, in this one virtual reality, it shares a rule set. And the rule set and you know, the rule set changes. Things change. Things wobble. You know, it has a lot to do with uh, you know conservation of energy and momentum and things like that. So you do have changes that are in solar system sunspots go in cycles. They come and they go, and you have all this sort of thing. So one thing is you have the rule set. 
The second thing is, is you have the consciousness system who can really do pretty well what it pleases. It's got all the data. If it's in its best interest, like we said, to create a crop circle, it can do that. Because if it helps people see things, have a bigger idea, kind of prize their mind open beyond just believing the, you know, the, the line that they get from, from the high priests of science, you know, that's good. So they can do that too. So if they, if they have events or things that help open people's minds, they may be created just for that reason, to open people's minds. Or it may just be the rule set. You know, it's just the way it is. Okay, every 10,000 years something wobbles because, you know, it's, it's a very complex system. In physics when you do, they, they have the two-body problem, which is just two things interacting with each other with gravity. Simple problem. We know how to do that with math. The three-body problem? It's almost impossible. And the billion body problem that we got going on, you know, in the universe, it's totally intractable, you know. So stuff happens that we don't know why because it is a hugely complex problem of everything affecting everything else, everything moving. And uh, so you get squirrely things come out of it sometime and you don't understand it because it's too complex to, to write down. Really, we have a hard time even with the three body problem simulating it in a, in a computer. It's a very difficult thing to do. And that's just three. You can imagine, you know, with a solar system or a galaxy or whatever, that, you know, the complication that's in there. So a lot of times these, these odd events are just things we don't grok. You know, we don't understand them because the rule set's very complex. Everything's the same as everything else except not always. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, in a virtual reality, almost anything can happen. You know, it's just, it's probability. It's a probabilistic reality. And here's something that will only, you know, that the probability is one in a million. Well, take, take um, uh, tunneling. You know, tunneling is a well-known effect in, in, in physics. It's actually a technology. We make tunneling diodes. So tunneling is just something we can depend on. What tunneling says is that you have a bunch of particles, say electrons, and you confine them to this this well, the space, it's like a, a hole they can't get out of. Okay, they're confined in there. They just don't have enough energy to get out. It takes a certain amount of energy, like escape velocity, to get away from the Earth. They just don't have enough energy to get out. It's impossible for them to get out in a classical sense. Well, it turns out there's a probability that's like, uh, you know, one in a million that they could get out for some reason. It's just not probable. What happens, though, if you have a billion particles in there, and they have one in a million of getting out, and they're all looking around, what happens is you get a whole lot of them get out. You see, because one in a million out of a billion particles bouncing around, that one in a million happens lots. So that's called tunneling. A particle just suddenly appears outside that well for no particular reason whatsoever. It just stops existing in there and starts existing out here because we live in a probabilistic reality. In the in a, in a reality that's deterministic and that's, um, uh, you know, the way physics would like to have this reality is, it's impossible. But yet, it's not only possible, we depend on it. You know, we make parts. Parts of the parts that are in this, you know, stereo system and things are tunneling diodes that depend on that little leakage current coming out and it's all magic. It disappears in here and appears out there. So, you know, almost anything can happen when you have as much stuff going on as we have, the one in a million stuff can happen a lot. You know, and all you need is a little bit of uncertainty mm -hmm. to cover it. You know, you can have a miracle, you can have somebody that's got, you know, 48 hours to live, and, and actually in 48 hours they're up and they walk out of the hospital and they don't have anything wrong with them. You say, well, that's a miracle. Well, there's some uncertainty there as to how that could come out because the biological system has a lot of uncertainty in it. It's so <laughs> complex, nobody really understands how it works. So there's uncertainty there. And if you have enough intent, you can modify that uncertainty. And if you modify it enough consistently enough, miracles can happen. Okay? A miracle is just something unexpected that doesn't happen if we have an objective reality. But things like that happen a lot, like double slit experiments happens all the time. Tunneling diodes happens all the time. So even the scientists know that these things happen all the time, they just don't know why. Because they don't understand we live in a probabilistic reality that's information. But miracles aren't.
impossible. They're just unlikely. Get enough people doing you know enough different things, and the unlikely will happen. Any more questions? We've driven you into the ground by now. <laughs> One more here. Do you say something about the continuity of consciousness and what happens as you get sure. the virtual reality over here? Okay. What happens? Let's start with what happens when you die, and uh, kind of go from there. And I guess I have to tell you, because when you start telling people, well, here's what happens when you die, they say, well, how do you know? You know? <laughs> well, when you have ability to, to uh, get around in the larger conscious system, you can follow the process. You can follow along with people who are dying and then die and what happens to them. You can do that. And if you, if you spend much time in the larger reality, just kind of wandering around, looking and observing and taking notes, somebody will put you to work. They'll give you a job, <laughs> just like around here, right? Somebody will give you a job. And I've had a job working in the reality frame where transitions occur. So I've seen it from both ends. I've traveled with, with it as people die, and I've been there when they get there. So that's just, and anybody can have those kinds of experiences. So what happens when you die is you find yourself aware in a different reality frame. Generally tend to be confused. What's going on here? What's this? Where am I? And then you realize that you're not really part of that physical frame anymore. Then you are kind of led or encouraged or whatever to move. Move away, well that's just belief. That's catering to your belief because you don't believe that you can get anywhere if you don't move. So we make tunnels. So the tunnels of light to move through because that gives us a sense of transition. Otherwise, we couldn't go anywhere because you can't go anywhere if you don't move. You know, it's that sort of thing. So things happen based on our beliefs. If you don't have that belief, then you don't need a tunnel. See, but most of us do because we're in this reality where you can't go from A to B without moving. So we have a nice tunnel to give us a sense of moving through. And you get a sense that you should go this way. Move toward the light, right? That's what you'll get. So there'll be the light for you to move toward. And all of these things that happen to you here are basically things to defocus you from what you've just been through, from this virtual reality. Because the virtual reality that you've just left will fade very much like a dream. In the first few seconds it's very clear and then it's a little foggy and foggier and foggier and after a while you don't remember it anymore. Now that upsets a lot of people because they say, oh what about my children, what about my the loved ones left behind and so on. It fades like a dream. Okay, it goes away. And the point of in the transition reality, it's another virtual reality, is to make you feel comfortable, to not have anxiety because if you're having a lot of fear and if you interpret things based on your fear, you're just going to create all kinds of problems for yourself. So it's just, oh, you're fine. You know, here's your Uncle Harry and Aunt, you know, Aunt Susie and so on. They're here to greet you. Well, it's not really Uncle Harry and Aunt Susie. It just looks like them, talks like them, thinks like them, has in the database every experience, every thought that Uncle Harry and Uncle Susie, uh, you know, right, Uncle Harry and Aunt Susie had. So it's really a whole lot like them, but it's just out of that historical database. Uncle Harry and Aunt Susie are doing their own thing. They're growing someplace else. They're not standing around waiting for you to die so they can greet you. you know, <laughs> that's not what it's about. It's about evolving. So, But you have the database and they are perfect copies in every way except they don't have free will. You see? Because they don't need free will in that state. They're just in a, a database. So anyway, you get, but all of the point of meeting you know, old relatives is to make you relax. Oh, everything will be all right. Look, they passed over and they're okay and they're everybody smiling and they're happy. Oh yeah, come on, it'll be fine. It'll be nice. Uh, come on in. Uh, let's see. Go. You need to go over there and see that line. Go over there and stand in that line, and uh, they'll be with you and tell you what to do and what's going on. No, oh, everything's. Yeah, you know, you're not in hell. Everything will be fine. And they give you this, and the whole point is just to let you relax and let go. Now, if you've got a lot of uptight about it, you're frightened, they'll make you stand in line a long time. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a long line. And when you get there finally, they'll tell you to go someplace else. It's just 
buying time to let you let go. You see, so a lot of it is nonsense. Now, if you don't need any of that, you skip all that stuff. You don't have to go to classes and stand in line and see the pretty lights and all the other things that are there just to distract you. So the whole point is to make you feel, oh, this is okay, I'm fine. Eventually, you get bored. All right, I've been standing in line for three days, you know. Somebody has lost my name, you know, you kind of want to go up and knock on the thing, you know. You know has somebody missed me or whatever? Then what happens is it's like, well, would you like to, uh, you know, continue growing? Would you like to uh, talk about, you know, what you, what you can do next? And then you get met by some people who will help you go through the process of the next incarnation. And in that process, if you are just in the beginning stages of this, you don't have a lot of planning going on. In the beginning stages, let's say you're a, a kind of a, a new individuated unit of consciousness. You don't need much planning. All you need is experience. So you hop in, hop out. When it's time to reincarnate, it's just go. You know, it's not any kind of setup or arrangement or anything else. The more evolved you get, the more specific experience will be valuable to you. Well, you work on a sore point, you know, you have, man you have anger management problems. So let's set you up in something that's going to challenge you as far as anger management goes. Because this really is what you need, you see. So now you're starting to plan. Or you've done it a lot of times. You may have certain entities that you're going to interact with with certain roles that they're going to play, people that you're supposed to meet, you know, connections to be made, and you may be part of a group. But, so it depends on where you are. There's from little planning to lots of planning. You may have done this enough times that you have a very specific mission. You're going to come back and your plan is to be this and do this for this reason. Maybe for that person, or maybe not. Maybe for humanity, it doesn't matter. But you have very specific things, and in which case, you're, you find your life here to be scripted, pretty much. Not that it's you don't have free choice, you do, but you're getting nudged all the time. Sometimes, you know, you'll be doing perfectly well and a little voice will come in your head and say, you know, you need to move to California. You know, you need to do this, you need to do that. You'll open a book and there it'll be a picture of California, you know, and you'll say, every time I do something, you know, this keeps jumping in my mind, okay, I'll go. You get these nudges, so it's not as predetermination, but the system will nudge you toward being what it is you need to be because you've got this plan, this person you have to meet, this thing you have to do. You get a lot of help in doing it. Other times you may have a plan but you make you have free will. You make a choice that takes you someplace else. Hell no, I'm not going to California, you know. And then, well, that plan just fell apart. You know, that happens sometimes. You know, all the plans don't necessarily work. Or maybe you'll say, hell no, I'm not going. You'll take a new job in Connecticut that job will go out of business and will send you to California. You know? <laughs> that happens sometimes too. You know, sometimes those sorts of things happen. So, so that's kind of the process of going through this. You relax. Once you relax, you get bored. When you're ready to go on, you go on. By then, this past life you just had is basically gone. Now there are exceptions. This is just the normal process. There are people who come in terrified. There are people who come in obsessed with something, you know, and they're a harder case because to make them let go, they've got all this energy and fear or whatever tied up around it. To get them to let go takes a lot more hand-holding and cajoling and talking and things. So some people have a, a kind of a rocky process if they come in obsessed or so tightly focused on a particular detail that they can't let go of it. Most people, not the problem. It just, it fades very quickly. You go through the process. So here, here we are, you know, we get out, you know, we get some advice, we go back in, we get out, you know, we're just cycling around. Well, that's what we do. That's our part of our job in this larger conscious system is we're lowering our entropy. We're helping the whole system evolve. We're helping this virtual reality evolve. You know, we're part of the process of things getting better. And you can't do it all in one lifetime. Now, like in the many worlds ideas, like, well, you just do it all at once, it's all parallel. Education doesn't work like that. Learning doesn't work like that. It's this way. If you could, if you could duplicate yourself into ten people, and all of you went to high school, all ten, you know, four years later, you'd all have a high school diploma, right? 
Well, you just repeated the process. Yes, they were all different schools. Yes, you came out a little different knowledge and all of you are a little different, but you're all really about the same. You're, you're, you're 10 of you with a high school diploma. Whereas if you take just one and go through, you know, 10 different, so you go through high school, then you go through college, then you go through graduate school, you see and you do this 10 times. Well, the time you've gone through this 10 times, you have a whole lot more knowledge because knowledge builds on itself. Because you know this allows you to know that. So knowledge is serial. It's more efficient to be done as a, as a cumulative process. So that's why we have to have these past lives. We're going, that's a cumulative process. We're learning to just do it in, you know, all at once isn't effective for us. That's not learning. Learning is cumulative. You build on what you've got. So we have to have past lives in order to work this out. Becoming love is not an easy thing to do. Letting go of fear and ego is not an easy thing to do. So we do it over and over again. So that's our job, basically. We're, we're employed in a consciousness evolution factory, and we are supposed to grow up. And if we don't grow up, then the system doesn't get the benefit of our, you know, of our success. And if the system doesn't grow up, it'll dissolve and go away. So the system isn't perfect. It's just the system. It's just what it is. More questions? Yes, sir. You've uh, said this at least twice that I've heard in that um, that we are becoming love. Mm -hmm. I come from a perspective that says that we are love by nature, by our divine creation. We are love. It's not something we have to become. It's not something uh, that we're not. We no. are that. That, I would say, is just semantics. You're defining us, what we are, as basically our potential to be. Okay, get rid of all the fear, get rid of all the ego, and we are love. Oh, except we have this fear and this ego and stuff that keeps us from being love. Well, okay, that's fine. That's a, you know, it's a way of saying it. It's a way of stating the words. It's the same thing to say we are this person with fear and ego, and we're getting rid of it, which has us becoming love. There's no difference between the two concepts. It's just a semantic issue about how you, the metaphors that we use to, to say it. Yeah. Yes. In our evolutionary process, is it possible, for example, the whales have always intrigued me in their communication. Um, is it possible to evolve um, and be a whale versus a human being in reincarnation? Sure. You can, uh, everything that's conscious, everything that's sentient, or maybe I have to say sentient, uh, is in the same evolutionary you know, process that we are. It's not just people, but everything that is you know, aware consciousness is evolving. Now, and all consciousness evolves pretty much with the same process. It's just that different levels of awareness you know, have different size decision spaces, different kinds of choices, therefore may grow quicker or slower because it's a, there's more choices available of what to do and how to do it, and the choices are more, maybe more significant, have more consequences. So all critters are different, all people are different, but it's all basically the same thing. Now, if you want to reincarnate back in some other reality frame, some other virtual reality, it doesn't have to be this universe, it could be some other universe. could be some other planet in this universe. It could be as a dolphin. could be as a, as a guark on some other uh, planet, you know, or some other virtual reality, whatever that is, you know, some other critter that evolves some other place. You have all that ability to choose. But most people, in fact, just keep coming through here as humans, you know, people who are humans come through here as humans because it's what they already know. We tend to do what we're familiar with what we're habituated to. Why? Because there's a lot of ropes to learn in a process. And if you already know the ropes in this process, you know, why get in another process? But then some people say, I didn't like that process, you know. I'd rather be this way. And yes, a dolphin, a dog, a cat, a bird, whatever suits you. But it has to be something that has its end result is 
growth, personal growth for you and for the system, a lower entropy consciousness, more quality. If it isn't, if it's just like, well, I just want to lay back and, you know, experience whatever. It doesn't have anything to do with my growth, you know, or anything else. I just want to do this. Well, the system's not going to be real anxious to have you wasting your time because you're, you're an employee and you need to, you know, get away from the water fountain and get back to work. So <laughs> you probably won't do that because you'll be discouraged from doing that. But if you really, really want to, I really always wanted to know what it's like to be a, you know, to be a, a dog or to be a dolphin or something. Sure, why not? Let the lady have her choice. You know, let her do it once and then it'll be out of her system. She can concentrate on other things. There's no problem with that. There's no problem. And sometimes there's specific reason. You may want to come back here as a dog so that you can be with somebody else in that particular form. So that you can interact with them in a particular way. You know, sometimes dogs can be agents of change in our life. They can be very significant. They change your whole you know, perspective on things. And there's dogs and then there's dogs, you know, and some of them are, have, this, have this connection that's uncanny. You know, they're better than you. You know, they really can, you can connect with them. They're not just some dog that wags its tail and, and does what dogs do. It's really special connection for you. Well, that's probably somebody that you know who's incarnating with you or is very special to you that you want to be with that is doing this in this way or has a particular purpose in giving you a choice that nudges you into a better view of life, a better decision. So yes, you can. that can happen. It's all just consciousness. But if you go, it'd be like you know, coming back as a dog just to do it would be like uh, being in sixth grade and deciding you just want to coast a while, so could you go back to third grade, <laughs> you know? Well, generally the, the principals say, no, I don't think so. We're not going to let you go back to third grade just because you're feeling lazy, you know? It's sort of like that. Other questions? So they got a travel agency up there. <laughs> yeah. You can travel around, you can do that, but what happens is most people who try doing that after a while they get bored. You know, I want to explore, that's a valid option, but you can get bored with that. And it's generally not encouraged because it's generally not all that productive. Which brings us maybe to one other thing. Some people get confused with the idea that, okay, I did a lot of out of body first and, and that sort of thing, and that out of body and Paranormal things are kind of a path through which your development needs to take place. And I think that this, these phenomena are important to their spiritual growth. They're not. You don't need to ever do anything paranormal to grow. All you need to do is get rid of that fear and ego. Those expectations, wants, needs, desires. You need to get rid of those beliefs and you will grow. That's all there is to it. So these, you know, Doing these other things, doing these paranormal things, going out of body, you know, learning how to remote view, you know, seeing auras, all the neat things that you can do with consciousness are not necessary. They're available to you if you want them and if you're willing to do the work to get your mind to settle to the point that you can do those, but they're not necessary. Is it, isn't that part of the intellect? Yes. It, well, it's if it's... Intellect? It can be part of your intellect. Mm -hmm. And if it's, the neat thing about these phenomena is that they attract a lot of people. A lot of people get interested in a spiritual journey because what they want to do is heal or they want to go out of body or something. So it kind of brings them in, sort of like a, a pretty flower to a bee. But then once they get here, if they grow up any, they realize that that's really not the point. You know, they may try and that may be frustrating, but they start to get a sense of something bigger and a bigger reality. So it's the kind of thing that attracts people in and hopefully they go on on their own. So it's not really important to do that. I happen to go that path because one of my jobs here was to figure it out and to make it science. And I needed to be able to do research there. So I had facility there. So it was on my path to do what I did. It's not that it's a requirement and the idea, oh, I see yours, I'm more you know, advanced than you are sort of thing, is silliness. It has nothing to do with advancement. It's not that that's a badge you get because you, you know, got all the answers right on the test. It's just something that's available to you as consciousness. And if at the same time it helps you grow up, you should do it.
if it's just your ego or your intellect, you know, wants to go on a joyride, you should skip it. It's not really important. Whatever happened to you in a past life is not really important. That's just your ego that wants to know. It doesn't have anything to do with you growing up, usually. Not necessarily true all the time. Sometimes it may be a critical understanding. You'll know those things. Follow your intuition. Your intuition knows what you should be doing. If you're leading with your core being, you'll make all the right decisions. If you're leading with your intellect, you'll confuse yourself and you won't know which way is up. Intellect isn't that good at making big decisions because the intellect wants logical process. In almost every important decision we ever get to make, you don't have enough information to feed a logical process. The answer is never deductive. You know, this, therefore, that. Who should I marry? How many children should I have? You know, should I smack this person or should I apologize to them? You know, <laughs> all these things. You don't have enough information. You have to deal with that at the at the core level, not with at the algorithmic level of logical processes. It's, doesn't do that. There's so few things in our total life that we ever do that are deductive that we, all we do is we kid ourselves thinking that we are logical people. The men more than the women, but we all kid ourselves that we are logical, rational beings. We're not really. We tend to think we are because that ego, I mean, that intellect is so good at justifying whatever it is we want as being rational. Is this an endurance contest? <laughs> but I'll, I'll keep going as long as you're interested. Oh, yes, please. One question, and that is, it sounds from what you were saying as though evolving requires coming back in into a body or into some sentient being. Right. Is that... Doing something, yes. Otherwise, you'll stay the same. Now you can be in some other virtual reality. You don't have to come back to a physical reality. There's lots of different virtual realities. You can remain in some other virtual reality, but you need to be in an experiential reality. That's a, that's a reality in which you have experience. You're, you're trading data in that reality. Well, that's a virtual reality. So virtual realities are of all sorts and types. Like the one after you die, that's a virtual reality. Your dream reality is a virtual reality. And you can exist within those the problem with those is that for most people, most of the time, the growth path is not as good, it's not as quick, it's not as, because you don't have the traction that you have here, you don't have all the feedback, you don't have all the choices, you're, you're like you're in that chat room, and everything's kind of nebulous and, and airy, and, and it's hard to tell what's going on. This is not always, I'm just kind of saying what's under the fat part of the curve, but most of the time, that's the, that's the case. So we do tend to come back to a physical reality because that's kind of the fast track in evolution of consciousness, is, is this. I want to thank you very much before I leave, and I'm hoping for a better prostate in my next life. Thank <laughs> 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 you so much. I really it. <laughs> Put that request in. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. If you want to learn more about it, if you think there's something here that interests you or information you could use, go to YouTube first. Do the uh, the. Uh, videos there, like I say, I have a whole lot of them. Some of them are only 10 minutes long and some of them are like 14 hours. <laughs> um, so you can do the little ones if you like, but the ones that are 14 hours are usually two days of a workshop, you know, an all day Saturday and an all day Sunday. And that's where you'll get most of the information. Those are, those are fairly complete. But the book is another animal altogether. The, the videos are not just an explanation of the book. The book is different, goes into different things in, in more detail. And like I said, that's free on Google Books. So that's where you should go for more information. Do you need to know math? <laughs> no, you do not need to know math. The, the books were written for 
you know, for everybody. They're not written for scientists at all. I tried, I tried to avoid that. Otherwise, I would have had a very small audience. <laughs>